learning. I hereby call to order the Roseville um, City Council meeting for Monday, October 16th, 2023. I guess it's kind of a work session. Um, uh, we have with us at the table here um, City Manager Trudgeon and our City Attorney, Christine, Christina Cruz Jennings. Um, and uh, I'll ask Mr. Trudgeon to call the roll, please. Councilmember Groff. Here. Councilmember Strong. Here. Councilmember Schroeder. Here. Councilmember Etten. Mayor Rowe. Here. And Councilmember Etten indicated previously he was not able to be here uh, this evening. Um, we also have a number of uh, staff and guests in the audience who will be participating in the meeting as agenda items come forward and we'll make introductions at that time. <coughs> Excuse me, I did also want to note for people in the audience here if you do have a cell phone to make sure and silence it or otherwise assure that it doesn't disrupt the meeting. Uh, we are not doing uh, remote participation by members of the public at this time so there isn't any need to instruct folks with uh, Zoom instructions. Uh, so with that, uh, uh, next item on the agenda would be to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, if you're able. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next on the agenda this evening is approval of tonight's agenda. We don't, we have but two items on the agenda, so hopefully this will be a fairly non-controversial action. Uh, is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. It's moved by Councilmember Schroeder, seconded by Councilmember Strawn to approve tonight's agenda. Any discussion on that motion? Uh, hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion passes unanimously four to zero. We have our agenda this evening. Uh, next on the agenda is an opportunity for public comment. This is a chance for people in the public to speak on items that are not on tonight's agenda, uh, but may be of interest to people in the community or related to city business. Uh, so uh, once again, uh, this would be an opportunity in addition to other opportunities that come up during the course of the meeting as agenda items come forward. Uh, but with that, is there anyone here this evening who wishes to speak under general public comment at this time? All right, seeing no one. We'll uh, close the general public comment opportunity and move right into our business items. Our first business item this evening is item 7A, which is to receive an update from the Roseville Police Department's Multicultural Advisory Committee. So we'll uh, ask those folks to come forward and... Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Yep, and uh, feel free to introduce yourselves and uh, we look forward to your update this evening. Sure, well, thank you. I'm uh, Terry Newby and I'm a member of the, uh, the Multicultural Advisory uh, committee, uh, which works with the police department. And I'm Etienne Gavi, I'm a member of the MEC as well. Okay. Thank you. So we thought it would be important for us to sort of uh, bring the members of the council up to speed on what uh, MAC has been doing. Uh, for those of you, I think most of you know, but for those who don't, the MAC was founded in uh, 2020 uh, as an opportunity to build relations between uh, uh, the members of the community, particularly the multicultural members, uh, people of color, and really to build relationships um, with the police department. So uh, the city council was, was instrumental in forming that. That was in 2020. Um, since then, MAC has been working with the police department to do uh, a number of what we think are really uh, important and influential initiatives. Uh, first, uh, MAC members have been involved in um, selection of uh, uh, potential police candidates, not necessarily selection, but the interview process, being involved in the interview process with uh, potential police candidates to make certain that they um, understand the com complexities and the nuances of working in a community like ours that is a very diverse uh, racial and ethnic background. And so MAC has been uh, working with the police department on some of those hiring decisions. Uh, we have also, with the police department, made presentations to uh, high school students at the Roseville Area High School to make them aware of what MAC is and what it does and to give them opportunities to uh, volunteer with the, uh, with the committee uh, and show leadership. And with that, we've had some great cooperation from uh, several teachers and administrators at Roseville High School, including Greg Euland, uh, who has been uh, very, very cooperative with us and made his students and his classes available to a presentation uh, with the MAC. And that was, um, for those who were there, it was, uh, if you haven't been in a high school before in a while, <laughs> talking about policing, it was a very interesting afternoon. And we learned some things from them and it was good. But I really feel that we made a really good um, impression and it was a good way for us to 
reach out to the youth of Roseville. Um, another thing that we've done working with the police department is um, the traffic stop initiatives. And for those of you who, who don't know, the uh, Ramsey County PD, John Choi, uh, the St. Paul Police uh, Police Chief, and the Roseville uh, Police Department made uh, an executive decision to no longer rely on low-level, non-public safety-related equipment violations for stops, so expired tabs, um, you know, license plate lights being out, tail light, that sort of thing. Uh, the type of what I describe as non-public safety related low level equipment violations because the data indicates that those types of stops disproportionately affect people of color and low income people. And the data also show that when you pull people over for those things, you almost never get evidence of, a, of an existing crime or a larger crime. So basically, police resources are being used to pull over people of color and low income people with almost really never any, for lack of a better term, fruit, if you mean, if, I, if you know what I mean. They don't actually yield uh, other crimes. And so the data spoke for themselves and with the cooperation of John Choi and um, the St. Paul Police Department in Roseville, which really led the way, uh, the department is no longer going to make those low level non-public safety equipment related stops. Now they're still going to pull people over, but instead of ticketing, uh, they're going to make them aware of resources where they can get those things fixed. You should get your tabs replaced. Here's where you can get your license plate bulb fixed. Here, here's the things you can do to fix that instead of simply pulling people over, um, which leads to some unpleasant encounters both for law enforcement and for citizens over something that typically isn't a public safety violation. So those are the things that I think we've been up to. Etienne, please let me know if I forgot something. Um, I, I would like to um, add a little bit to a little bit of context to the last aspect that we just talked about, which is the concept of poverty. Uh, it's not a crime to be poor, and we have been working with the police department to say if people don't have enough money to fix the broken tail light, uh, and we give them ticket a fine. Are we not adding more to the poverty that uh, started the, the whole cycle in the first place? And as a result of that, we, the, the police department in, uh, in coordination with Ramsey County has done to take in the action that uh, Terry was talking about earlier. And I believe there was some more concrete data when it came to uh, the impact of that policy since it was enacted uh, I think uh, we talked about maybe 1,800 stops uh, not being made uh, since that policy was enacted. Uh, to me, that is a really big number. That is 1,800 people who otherwise would have been pulled over and uh, interaction between police and community, bad thing could have happened. But the, the even nicer thing about this thing is um, if you don't want to pull over people and you um, try to get them to know however that their equipment is, is not functional, how do you do it? And I was so uh, pleasantly surprised that the police officers can, uh, when they run a plate, uh, an email or a mail can be sent to the person's home with actual number to call so that there's no interaction between police officers and uh, and community. And that's just a wonderful, wonderful thing that I'm so happy that you guys are doing. It's, 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 it's it feels good. So I uh, just wanted to add that. One other thing that we as MEC have been uh, involved in is the hiring of uh, the social worker um, uh, embedding the police department. We are the proud that the Roosevelt is taking those steps to make policing um, not about crime, about crime, but also about poverty. How do we uh, solve the issue? How do we face poverty? Excellent. I think that's a wonderful point. Thank you. I'd forgotten about the, uh, the, the data, the numbers. Thank you for that update. Are there any questions or feedback from the council uh, to the members of the MAC uh, who are with us this evening? Uh, council Member Strong. Thank you. And thank you for the update on um, the partnership with Lights On. That's something that I came to Corey with um, 
uh, in the police department in 2019 after going to a workshop with the members who started that and so excited about it and it's nice to see that it's in full place um, because I it's had great results and I actually had seen it win award elsewhere um, from the Minnesota Council on Nonprofits for Impact and so I think it's really great that we are participating in this um, influential program and we can be models as well to other places so I really appreciate that I know um, when I've had previous conversations with ATN specifically but about fear around the police it really um, makes I'm glad to hear that that reduction in crime um, in those police interactions it's hard for me to imagine at times or not anymore but in the past to understand what it's like to interact unnecessarily with the police and so uh, between being a person of color and someone who may be as poor it's really important to be reminded that that can be a really scary situation and that um, it takes a level of harm out of the equation that just doesn't need to be there I was curious I feel like they have two questions um, how many members are currently on the MAC and then kind of I don't know if I ever feel um, strongly about what our relationship is between what you do and what we do um, our other commissioners are, are appointed by us and that's not and yet we love to know about your information and what you're doing but we don't have a lot of um, oversight or impact or decision making and so I I don't know if there's a formal relationship between us but I think it would be interesting to consider as we move forward sure uh, well I, I can tackle those right now we have uh, I believe is approximately 20 um, listed members of the MAC uh, obviously uh, we have different levels of participation there are some who drop off there's some who join but right now I as of my, my email list has my email membership list has 20 members and so we are actively recruiting we've uh, gotten a few more members uh, from the community uh, uh, a couple of uh, pastors uh, from the faith, faith communities in Roseville who've expressed an interest in joining and so we welcome them uh, there's also been some interest from some college students at the U of M uh, one of them was unable to ultimately unable to join uh, because of her schedule apparently they're expected to go to school uh, <laughs> And, and so she was unable to join because of her schedule but uh, she did tell me that if, when her school schedule gets straightened out next year she really does want to become a member and there are other students uh, of color at the U of M who are also very interested in joining so there's a pipeline there so right now it's 20 hopefully we get more because there's some who participate more than others uh, as far as the relationship with the uh, City Council I, I think you're right I don't know if there's a formal reporting relationship I uh, certainly would be happy to do that because I think it's important this is um, as, as I tell the members of the committee this is uh, a wonderful opportunity that's a leadership opportunity not just for us but for Roseville to show the world what effective community-based policing looks like and you know when I did my research there are a lot of places that don't have this uh, and there are a lot of places that frankly don't want it and so for us to have it and want it and make it work with that partnership with the police department I think it's important so I would very much welcome uh, a, a whatever type of formal relationship the council would consider uh, because I view this as an opportunity for the council to promote Mac um, which in fact which in effect promotes Roseville uh, and I think it aligns with the community's values and if I may add one line to it it is uh, with this important data showing the improvement, the numbers, is there any way the city or the city council could help get the word out? Because uh, we as MAC can be doing some of this work with the police department, but if we don't have the capacity of getting the words out, how does the community know that this work is being done and the impact is, is having on the day-to-day the -day activity of people? So that would be something that if we can get some help from uh, the uh, council we we'll appreciate it I think that's probably something we can look at you know a newsletter article or something like that as, mm -hmm. as a follow-up and you know maybe just kind of a scheduled periodic update from the Mac on whatever is going on at that particular time or since the last update uh, and then you know in terms of the data we certainly have our, our pretty robust data portal on the police mm -hmm. department's website also that if that data isn't there mm -hmm. um, either we if it is there we can highlight it better or if it isn't there we can we can add it but I think those are uh, excellent points about that communication piece. Uh, I saw Councilmember Graf. 
Well, just to piggyback on that, also, even you being here tonight, I mean, I know we yeah. don't have a huge following, but people do. I'm, I'm always surprised at how many people do watch the council meetings, so this was good to get this information out. Because I'd heard a little bit about what you're talking about, but even on the council, I hadn't heard as many details as you're talking about right now, so this is really helpful, especially reaching out to the high schools. I think that's crucial to get some input from the youth. Uh, they have a different life experience than someone my age, mm -hmm. say, so, so I think that's really helpful for us. I wanted to also say I think your points about poverty are so important because uh, that is a cycle that can just spiral down when you end up with you know, maybe we don't think a traffic ticket is the end of the world, but someone who's already working two jobs and has a family of four and, and uh, their spouse is working, it could be the thing that tips them down to losing their car or whatever it is. So I think that's really important work. And I want to thank you and the police department for that. The, the thing I wanted to add in relation to that is the other aspect of that is oftentimes, you know, those, those very minor uh, equipment violations can be sort of an entry into the criminal justice system for someone too, especially mm -hmm. if they're not able to pay their fine. Then now they've got a warrant out, and next time they're they're you know seen by officers, the license is checked, it says there's a warrant. Mm -hmm. They get pulled over, and as we unfortunately know, that those types of situations can lead to uh, adverse consequences as well that uh, nobody wants to happen either. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, the less that we can sort of bring people into a system. Um, that they that they really don't need to be in, you know. I think that's that that program is exactly the benefit in terms of that aspect as well. So mm -hmm. definitely wanted to make sure that that folks in the public are aware of that. That it's you know there's the financial aspect, but there's also that sort of potential for somebody to just sort of get into a cycle of you know not being able to pay a fine, having a warrant out, uh, maybe evading a uh, or, or not being able to make a court appearance. Now there's another warrant out or there's an enhanced warrant or whatever. It becomes very, very you know bad for somebody very quickly and that can just have so many you know adverse consequences right. for sure. individuals that that began this whole thing with uh, you know a, a, a broken tail light or, or a missing license plate light or an expired tab or something like that. you know so exactly exactly. Uh, Councilor Shelley. Yes, I'd also like to echo what um, <coughs> Council Member Groff said, but I also wanted to add, I really appreciate you working on some positive solutions for this. I mean, so many times we look at data and issues, and yet you're working on some ideas and solutions to make things better, and I can really appreciate that. And working with the police department so closely, I can't imagine a, a better place to try to improve things for our community. So thank you so much for all the work you do. Thank you. Thank you. And Mayor Rowe, to your point, obviously, I mean, someone, it, it would be a huge tragedy to have someone involved in the criminal justice system because their license plate light was out. It just makes no sense for anyone. Exactly. Exactly. Right. The other thing I was just going to mention in terms of a formal relationship with council, I'm not sure that the, the, that the committee necessarily wants to get to a point of being like a commission as, as, uh, as actually both of you have been on city commission. So you, yes. know, you know the, the interview process and the, and the council deliberation over appointments. And I think, I think that you know, the, it was intentional, I believe, mm -hmm. to set this committee up without a lot of that for lack of a better word, baggage. Um, because yes. people can engage as they're able to, they, there's not this formal process and expectation of, of uh, you know, strict attendance rules or you get tossed off or things right. like that. So, so uh, you know, I think that that arrangement seems to make a lot of sense. And it, it I agree, I well. agree. So Having I been on a commission. I'm not saying anybody was <laughs> suggesting that, but I definitely think the connection in terms of communication and reporting uh, is, is beneficial and, and we should, uh, you know, work to, to continue that. and. And make sure it's a pretty routine thing. Right. Yeah. Having been in a commission, I, I like for this what we're trying to do here. I believe the informal format works best. I was thinking more along as reporting or maybe mm -hmm. regular mm -hmm. report outs uh, in terms of the relationship. But we, I, I agree. I, I don't think that we need to be at the formal level of, of a of a commission. And I I think I was thinking more of um, some of our work with some of the other commissions where we um, have asked them to kind of have goals and things like that. That so we are working and. We are, we look to them, at least I look to the other commissions and look to them for giving us guidance. And so I want to, I would love to be able to like take this information and go, okay, well now we know this. And obviously we're here and we're smart and we can do that on our own, but it would be really nice in some way to formalize a relationship in that we have this thing that is unique. 
And so maybe it just stays within the police department. But I just thought if there was an opportunity to talk more about it and make sure that it's seen as something that kind of helps guide the work of what we do. But we don't need to manage how many meetings you attend. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and we don't Thank need you. to do all that. Um, but I think just formalizing that that uh, consultancy, that uh, understanding that, you know, you do come, you can come to us, you know, that you can report out to us mm -hmm. and that we seek and respect what you bring to us. So. Well, and for that matter, if there are policy recommendations that aren't maybe directly advising the police department itself, but maybe more to something that comes to the council level of, of consideration on a policy basis, you know, absolutely, if the, if the MAC wants to bring something forward and make a suggestion uh, for something we should be taking a look at, maybe adopting as a policy, I think that's, that's something we're looking for too, so definitely. Wonderful. Okay. All right. I, I guess the question for the ask today is uh, how, what are the ways, I think you, the mayor, you mentioned uh, the city newsletter, what are the ways this work can be promoted to the community. I think that's that, that would be the big ask from us today. Right. Mm -hmm. um, not that we necessarily need an answer today, but um, something that I, if you can um, help us get the work. Sure, I think also, be yeah. between our communication staff, our police department staff, and members of the, of the committee itself, so we'll, we've, we've got a lot of good minds here we can put to, together towards uh, coming up with some, some ways to communicate. The reason I mentioned the newsletter is that still at least as of our last survey, which goes back a few years now, uh, that's one of the primary ways people in the community seem to get their information. So it's, we don't want to miss out on that opportunity. But certainly, if there's other ways to make those connections with folks in the community as well, uh, you know, I like the idea of visiting visiting the high school, visiting classes, and things like that that the committee's already doing. So you know, where there are those opportunities out there to to do that, right? And I think there's a lot of different ways we can, I mean, we've got plenty of people here who are, who are good at the communications and then opening up those lines. So I think that's something we can uh, continue to work on. But I, uh, I do think regular reporting in some way, or at least regular updates, where you guys know what we're doing and we can seek input from you, I think that would be beneficial. So thank you for raising that. And just for the benefit of the folks who are watching the meeting, either live or later on, uh, there is information in the uh, Council packet this evening with some of the details that were talked about in your presentation as well. So right. folks can can get to that uh, from our packet <coughs> portal, as it were, as well. Right. So, all right. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank, Thank you so much. And pass along our thanks to everybody else on the committee as well. Thank you. All right. I guess we'll take about a five minute break here just to configure for the Planning Commission joint meeting. We've got a lot of, uh, a lot of arranging to do for everybody. Anybody who wants to can come up I to the table. It's kind of a iconic More the merrier. Together, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and I went two days. Do we all have to sign in? Oh, yeah. No, we do not. <laughs> we know who you are. We know who you are. You know better. Yeah. And we know where you live. <laughs> That's right. That's the bad part. You didn't get it. You didn't get it. No, but my husband is really good. Oh, no. So, okay. So the question I asked when I heard about the joint meeting and, and it was going to be a work session, I said, well, it'd be great if we could all be at the table. And then I said, it'd be great if we could actually all be at the table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Looks like we're fitting everybody. Sure, yeah. So uh, let's see, in terms of mics for folks, um, why don't we, maybe that one can be shared by the two gentlemen at the end. Let's maybe sit between them and Michelle, if you and, and Pam can share that one, and then Michelle and Pam, and then I think we're going to a cup. Right. And we'll, we got a bonus one there too. Okay. Very good. And I've lost track of who the chair is right now. Is it you? Okay. All right. I apologize for that. Oh, it's all right. All right, we're ready to come back from a break.
back from our short break to configure and the table just got a lot more crowded for folks but uh, hopefully we can fit all the people and the conversation into our discussion this evening. Uh, we're welcoming our uh, Planning Commission for a joint meeting. It's been a little while since our last joint meeting with the Planning Commission, so we appreciate you all being here. Uh, and I know we've had a little bit of turnover on the Commission as well, so a lot of newer faces to, to see again and uh, appreciate that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Chair Pribble to uh, introduce folks on the Commission and then uh, kick off the conversation this evening. Sure. Thank you, Mayor. Council members for having us here tonight. It's it's nice to be back again after about a year to regroup and, and see what we've been doing the past year and, and where you might like us to um, head in the in the coming year. Um, if you want to just we could just go around and who we are. Tammy McGehee. Michelle Kurzel. Pam Aspinus. Eric Fiorum. Matt Bauer. So, you know, you already, you have um, in front of you activities and accomplishments since our last joint meeting, and I, I won't go through listing all of them, but I thought it might be helpful to highlight a few of them that influenced how, um, the items that we brought forward tonight for consideration. Um, so one of the things that we were, spent quite a bit of time on the past year was the phase two zoning code update project. Um, and that consisted of the Shoreland Ordinance and also studying sustainability incentives. And we know that the, in the end, the sustainability incentives didn't move forward, um, but that is one of the things that we were looking for possible direction from you tonight. Are there other ways besides the path that we had pursued to this point that might be worthwhile exploring in the coming year? Um, another item that we looked at this year that that related to that is the conditional use request for several drive-through facilities. So thinking about that in terms of sustainability, is there something there you know, other communities are considering not allowing drive-throughs or drive-throughs requiring other criteria to um, enhance the sustainability considering the, the trade-offs that there are with drive-throughs of additional traffic and exhaust. There were other, um, there were also several preliminary plat requests and uh, conditional use requests for increased density. And those um, generate a lot of conversation among the community and also among the, um, the planning commission about both um, understanding our, our role as a quasi-judicial um, group and making sure that the community understands that role that we have we have some responsibilities and some limitations in what we can do. And so one of the things that we really appreciated um, in you <coughs> allowing us to consider our purpose and scope and duties is really enhancing that communication with the community and, and helping them to understand what our role is, limitations and the opportunities and, and their opportunities as far as communicating their, their interests um, in how we move forward. Um, and related to that was you know, potentially having the opportunity to have more than one joint meeting per year to discuss things that might come up because we have just gone through two layers of, of zoning updates. Um, one of the, oddly, a highlight of the last year was the conditional use to allow a surface parking lot as a permitted use for FedEx on County Road C2. And, and the reason that that was a highlight, at least for some of us, was that Inadvertently, we got the opportunity to provide some feedback to them that was helpful in the design, made it, I think, a better design, and um, improved the community, improved the neighborhood. Um, so conversations around that led to one of the requests that we have to, for you to think about, um, to consider adding a sketch plan process to allow for informal planning commission input before project applications are submitted. So in that case, Initially, they submitted a parking lot plan that it turned out was not the one that they intended to submit. <laughs> so we continued the discussion to the following meeting with that. We still had discussion about it enough that they were able to address some of the neighbors' concerns for the following meeting. So we felt that we had been able to you know, help the community rather than just have to say yay or nay to a fixed plan. So um, I think that is a very quick summary. Um, so again, our, our questions or uh, concerns for you tonight are 
looking at our purpose, scope, and duties, the four items that we that we listed on the attached memo, and then if there are areas of zoning code that you would like us to look at in the coming year related to sustainability objectives. Great. Um, and I did want to uh, maybe start with some, some feedback just because sure. I remember the, ca the case of the, the parking lot and, and some of that back and forth and, and certainly I'll have some, some thoughts as well as other council members perhaps on, on the sketch plan process. Uh, but one of the things I kind of wanted to start with, especially from my perspective as long ago having been on the Planning Commission and certainly been on the council and, and you know, been through a lot of this process, um, is that uh, the, there is, I, do, I don't want the commission to feel so constrained that all you can do is either say yes or no to a proposal based on whether it meets, checks the boxes in the code. Because I think one of the legitimate roles and important roles that you have is, is, is as you're hearing something, if it seems fairly clear to the commission that something in the code is not working properly, I think a legitimate outcome of consideration of a proposal could be to say either we recommend denial for these reasons or tabling because we'd like to work on the code or you know we we've not made a recommendation and we would like the council to to ask us to to look at this particular issue or those types of things um, you know I, I I think that the, it can be it can be easy to think that that all you have to do is is you know check the code and if it matches the code that's that's the end of it and and I don't I don't want you to feel that you're kind of powerless to do anything else uh, so I want uh, you know and and I, please counsel correct me if I'm off base here but I think you know and I know uh, uh, Commissioner McGee when she was on the council that was one of the things I think that that we were trying to do is to make sure that the that the Planning Commission really understood that a, a part of its role can be to say hey you know. Um, yes, this this meets the letter of our code, but it do, this code doesn't make sense right now. And in the light of, you know, where we are today as a society, you know, sustainability may be different, um, or just our own experience with past projects as well. You know that, that sometimes that uh, that that can be something that can inform the process. And so, you know, just from my perspective, I I, I would prefer that the commission not feel so constrained that they can't allow an outcome such as one of those as a result of a, of a proposal being before you. Um, it makes it a little more challenging perhaps and you still have to sort of corral your, your members into a majority towards, towards that perspective if that's the direction the commission wants to go. Uh, but I certainly want to make sure that, that you have a, a good understanding from our perspective as a council that, that that's a legitimate outcome is to say let's, you know, because we've had cases where the commission has passed something along to the council and the council has ended up putting breaks on something kind of based on issues that were raised during the commission discussion. Um, so, you know, certainly I think the commission has as much opportunity to, to do that as well. Uh, you know, you certainly have your obligation to sort of pass your judgment onto the council, but I think a legitimate judgment is to say, yes, technically it meets the code, but I think we need to look at our code again. So wanted to get that out there kind of right away and make sure that's 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 at least understood as to how I'm coming at it and please once again council if I'm off base there let me know uh, here we go council member Schroeder yes um, I, I agree with oh. you mayor on that because I was looking at one of your items that said allow commission members to add discussion items you always had that um, you were allowed to do that all along so I was a little surprised to see that in here that um, you know, based on what the mayor just said, that's what we were expecting. That if something came up, that was you could say we need to add this to our agenda and talk about it because something came up in the community or whatever. I was I was hoping that you already knew that that was something you could do. So I was a little surprised to see that. I think I think the problem was there was no formal place on the agendas that came to us for us to add anything like that. And so it would require us, um, I think this was as close as we came to a consensus mm -hmm. that there's something missing. We would like to do this, but it doesn't appear on our agenda as, as an item that is available to us. Very similar to what we do on our agenda. Right, right, it, right. So, it's yeah. not, it's on your agenda. It wasn't so, on ours. So <laughs> what do we need to have that added to your agenda? I think you have to tell staff that it's Add okay. Add it to your agenda. <laughs> <laughs> you guys yeah. okay well, that? you know, I think what we, we just may want to look at because uh, we do have part of our council rules of procedure yeah. that applies to commissions yeah. and part yeah. that only yeah. applies to the council. Right. To the extent that there may be a, a, a lack of clarity on that or a lack of good direction to commissions right. on that, I think we 
can we can certainly work on that sure. and that, that we don't have to wait till necessarily our January right. meeting at the council to do that. If that's something we want to take a look at, we can always update our rules. Because if you talked about wanting them to ask about, talk about mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. you know, that sounds like you, they need to be able to talk about Well, things. I think there's, there's yeah. two aspects of that. Certainly as something is yeah. being considered, you have the opportunity to discuss as part of your mm -hmm. deliberation and make a recommendation. But to the point of if, if you do, if you say, you know, we've had four of these uh, or whatever number, seven of these, um, you know, uh, drive throughs and we'd like to talk about drive throughs mm -hmm. you know, I think that, that that we should probably have a mechanism uh, set up for you to be able to, to come back to that, so to speak, rather than only considering land use cases as your that, agenda goes That forward. would be helpful in, mm -hmm. in terms of preparing for this meeting and if, and if you wanted to consider the opportunity, if something comes up that we could have another joint meeting that would mm -hmm. help us to collectively prepare for that because otherwise we don't want to mistakenly have a quorum by having side conversations about what did you think about those drive throughs and what you know right so, no absolutely and, yeah. and I think the other thing too is it doesn't have to be just one more joint meeting and, and officially mm -hmm. scheduled I think anytime something comes up and if you've got this process in place and you can add something to your agenda and have a discussion about it and you come to a recommendation um, certainly that that should be an opportunity either to do a joint meeting or, or send some representatives or whatever is most appropriate. Uh, and I've got some more thoughts along those lines too, but uh, I, I don't want to uh, uh, leave other uh, council members out of the conversation as well. So certainly, uh, Council Members Groff and uh, Strawn, if you've got other thoughts, uh, Council Member Strawn. Thank you. And a lot of these are just notes I was taking as you were talking, but I think um, as you're looking for items that I see as I, I really appreciate I read through all of the things that are sent that your meeting minutes and you know your discussions and your agreements or your disagreements I really find those very helpful in making a, a final decision a lot of times by the time we get to us people are frustrated they're like well you know we didn't do anything well we really rely a lot on on your reviewing it totally because we're kind of working across such a large picture but I think as we come into the sacred settlement um, arrangement with the state of Minnesota, and they have many um, specifics that are required, but helping us um, apply how that works for Roseville, and if there's anything in particular we need to do to make sure that we can comply with that um, around planning, I think that would be very helpful. Um, I, I, I appreciate the continued effort to work towards sustainability but I'd say even a, a step further in that in my mind is um, the walkability of our city. And so people constantly um, remind us that the walkability and the access is really key. And so if there's anything that can be done within our ability as a city to uh, focus on that. And then you listed some properties that potentially land use applications, but I see a couple others that are sizable that should probably be on your radar is the vacant State Farm DOE building that is that really could have significant um, impact when up and when it changes into however many entities uh, go there and um, and then there's all the vacancies on Highway 36 right now restaurants and um, the car dealership and other things so just finding the right mix of things making sure that our zoning accommodates what we want to have in those kind of places. Um, there's a new church going in in the lifetime fitness, so making sure that we understand how that fits into the fabric. And then just some of our aging shopping centers that may uh, have a lot of vacancy, wondering how those will fit with the community and the neighborhood around it. So obviously working with the, the departments and making sure that it's within our ability to do, but I, I think those are big things that will be decisions that need to be made within the next couple of years that need to be on all of our radar, but I really appreciate if you're thinking along how that can work with planning. Councilmember okay. McGraw. Uh, I find this very interesting because I, I struggled with these exact same things when I was on your commission. <laughs> so I hope we can make some movement forward. Uh, there was confusion when I was on the commission on what we were allowed to do and what we weren't allowed to do, and it sounds like some of the things you're bringing up are exactly those. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would like to see us move forward so that you could have some sort of, you know, discussions and address these things and actually have some input on what could be done in the city in some ways, you know, not not micromanaging necessarily, but in bigger pictures. So those are just some things I think from when I was on the commission I would have liked to have seen and I would 
hope that you would be interested in that too. I really wanted to get to the topic of the sketch plan review because I know that's a process that in one form or another I think Roseville has done in the past. It goes back a, a while because uh, I remember seeing those before and I think they were actually even done before the city council sometimes. Um, I'm not sure that that's always the greatest thing because I think uh, developers just kind of like cater to the, what the, the whims of the whoever the five people are on the city council. Yeah. Um, and, and certainly, you know, one of the things we set up when we revised our process a number of years ago to add the open houses was the notion we were hearing a lot from residents that, you know, we don't hear about these projects until it's before the city council. We didn't even know about the planning commission hearing, you know, and things like that. Um, so, you know, hopefully the open house process has helped get people aware of projects uh, and, and help even with the word of mouth in the neighborhood if not everybody sees or is aware of the postcards for uh, hearings and things like that. Um, but I wanted to get your thoughts as to do you, do you think that that touch with the Planning Commission maybe should happen even prior to a neighborhood meeting and so that the developer can understand maybe what some of the issues are that they need to pay attention to uh, when they're having that that open house and so I just wanted to kind of turn the question back to the commission a little bit for some 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 maybe Additional information as to what your thought process is on talking about doing the sketch plan and how it fits into our existing system uh, I, Others weigh in too, but I think it would be helpful to have it as early as possible um, Coming from the other side of the table. I know that being an architect we'd prefer to get input from jurisdiction as early as possible so that you're not headed down a road that in the end is not going to be something that is is enjoyed by the community so the sooner the better and I think just in terms of the procedural requirements having it before the open house also gives everyone more time to deal with it rather than having open house and then there's a fixed schedule of limitation of time before which we have to make um, a decision and you have to make a decision on it. So for those couple of reasons, it would be helpful. And I think so, yeah, that's a good point because I think one of the biggest feedbacks I get, and I think you all have too, is people come and, and talk and then they say, well, I feel like there's nothing I can do or, you know, it's this, the decisions made or, you know, when at what, what point do I actually influence and, you know, and so I think if you allow people to come earlier in the process, maybe they would feel a bit more heard mm -hmm. versus when it's already done. I think we need to get that communicated too because I think by the time people show up at these meetings and open houses, they're thinking it's a done deal. This is what it's going to be mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's not what it is. Like I think the key to all of this is some communication mechanisms even between us and you and the community is what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes there is a mismatch between the expectations of the community and and what we can do and, and what you can do and we may be able to change the zoning in the future to accommodate some of the issues that come up, but we can't change it on the fly when the person has their materials there. I think if we've done it before, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If the if the process I think began with the staff and maybe the developer meeting with the community before the developer has put massive amounts of money and effort into having his plan that he's now rolling out in the community. I think that that's the key because nobody wants, the developer least of all, wants to make a lot of changes when people come and say, well, wait, this isn't really what we would like here. Um, and he has already spent, you know, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 getting all his, his ducks in a row. And I think if somehow the, the planning department or a subset of the group that wants to participate could participate in that neighborhood open house developer, I own this piece of property and I would like to do X. Um, what does anybody think about that? If I do X, are there any things that I can do to make that more palatable? And then, you know, at that point, when there is some flexibility, then even though the developer can walk away and say, 
I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. The zoning says I can, and that's what I'm going to do. And some of them will. But I think some of them, like we found with the FedEx, they really, the, the particular developer in that case, really made a, a great effort to be even more accommodating than the residents were asking. Um, and so I think, I think the, the good developers really do want to have their projects accepted, and they want to work with the community to the extent they can, but they don't want to be in the position of, of being forced to do something that they don't want to do also. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I would say that the key to the whole sketch pen plan process, I apologize for my voice, um, is that it's an informal presentation, right? Like, like um, Chair Pribble, I've been on the opposite side of that and it's, extremely helpful just to get you know preliminary sketches or renderings or something in front of people to get their feedback but what helps this side of things is that it puts notes on paper and so when that comes to us formally we have this information that we said you know we found these things important here's what we wanted you to look at let that developer come back to us or whoever's doing the project and say I looked at these things, here's what I did based on that feedback from the informal meeting and the open house, and then here's what I couldn't do. And that gives us a much more objective look at whether or not this kind of meets the intent of what the city wants us to look at. Well, I think that's a great point and something I was gonna mention as well is having sort of a single <coughs> reference document, if you will, mm -hmm. that tracks that feedback and the developer's response through the process, uh, regardless of whether we do a sketch plan step or not, I think that improvement would be helpful too. I think uh, to uh, Ms. Trusel's point, the, the notion of better understanding on the part of the participants, even in the open house that are members of the public as to, as to how early in the process that really is and how influential mm -hmm. they ought to be able to be mm -hmm. in the neighborhood in, input into a proposal um, it, it still, I think it still sounds like that there may be a benefit to have that, that touch with the Planning Commission even going into that open house because of the fact that the Planning Commission representing people in the community and, and a variety of different perspectives that may not even be completely represented on the council um, is an opportunity. And just from your experience in looking at applications as part of your, your you know, career on the Planning Commission, you can provide some insight uh, to developers that can be valuable. And I would say, you know, certainly a lot of proposals go through a staff review and don't even go any farther than that because the staff says, you know, this isn't even close to meeting our code or even our, you know, what our comp plan aspires to and things like that. And no, but none of us at this table even know about those proposals. And that's a good thing in the process. But I think there, I think there can be a benefit even, even from a staff perspective, and I certainly don't want to speak to staff, but to have some more insight about some of those things that, that well, yes, it does meet the letter of things, but here's some concerns that are coming from more people than just, you know, just the members of the staff who are very well trained and do their jobs extremely well, but may not always have that additional insight just from sort of the community. And so I think that's a valuable role for the Planning Commission to play. Mm -hmm. um, and I can see how that would work. And I think we would just need to think about the parameters around which, mm -hmm. you know, which types of proposals we're talking about doing sketch plans for. Is it every single thing? Uh, even things that don't have hearings before the Planning Commission or the Council, probably not. Um, you know, but I think so. I think that would be an opportunity once again for an, an agenda item on the on the Commission's, uh, you know, upcoming meeting agendas to maybe talk more about you know which types of proposals are the ones that we want to do this with, and I think that's it's good to get some insight from you know staff and maybe from a development perspective too because. I think you know we, we certainly don't want to create a process that's going to like stifle development in Roseville. I don't think anybody wants to do that. So we want to be mindful of, of that and, and get in as many voices in how we tweak our process as, as makes sense to do. So uh, that's that's some thoughts. I don't know if other council members have additional thoughts. You know, I think always the challenge is is how early do you get people in the community involved, um, and and how do they understand what their role is and then you know where does that go from there because certainly developers want to do a certain amount of expenditure and effort to get to a point where people can understand what they're trying to communicate as to what their plan is but they certainly don't want to spend any more than they have to to the point of view of, of if this isn't going to go anywhere you know they want to minimize their investment so you know we want to design a process i think that works 
works for our decision making as the government body, you know, makes things not uh, a ton more complicated for our own staff or for ourselves. Uh, and then once again, is, is mindful of, of how the development community fits into it as well. So, you know, unless there's <laughs> objection from the council, I think that would be, you know, a good thing for the, the commission to have some more discussion about and maybe come back with some recommendations to the council. Um, I did also want to say that sort of in line with, uh, and this gets back to my, my foreshadowing in my earlier comments, I was thinking about is there a way to maybe even have a representative or two from the commission, um, especially on, you know, maybe larger proposals that are more, for what, lack like of a better word, controversial, uh, that, that maybe the, co the commission had a lot of discussion on, you know, and it, maybe there's a way to, to think about having a representative or two from the commission you know, being at the, the council consideration of that item uh, to maybe just make a couple of remarks, uh, you know, to summarize the discussion that the commission had um, and, and some of the issues or concerns, you know, because meeting minutes are great and watching your meetings are great, but I think, you know, especially for the members of the public who may not have tracked that whole process, mm -hmm. you know, for them to see how we, how that process, you know, works and how the communication goes forward, I think that might be something to think about. Um, you know, I certainly don't want to give you more meetings to attend either, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, to the extent it can be better. And it could be a thing where you, as, as a particular proposal is being considered by the commission, the commission can make a call as to whether that makes sense um, on this particular proposal. And it may not make sense on all of them or even a lot of them, but uh, where it does, you know, I think that may be something to, to think about. And I don't know that that's a process we need to formalize necessarily unless you make a recommendation that we do that. But uh, that was a, that was another thought I had at coming into this discussion. So I kind of appreciated you prompting us with these, these uh, the four items because I think that uh, got the wheels turning. Yes. Is there anything else uh, council wants to talk about or think about or uh, commissioners, uh, council members Drummond? I just appreciate that comment and that uh, information about having someone come, you know, often it's up to us to try to recount the minutes and make it sound like we did the paper, read all everything, because a lot of people who watch us don't. And so they, you know, we come to a decision quickly and easily and, you know, and they still send us emails. I want to know <laughs> who did this. And you're like, oh, it's a long process. So I think if, you know, you were part of the process, I think it helps provide another level of understanding for people to see that it is a long process and we do have a lot of consideration about it and but if it works out for you I also understand but um, like I said and we do all try to take turns recounting the minutes mm -hmm. out loud so it sounds like you know we don't know what we're talking about so what do you mean it, you know <laughs> but I think just understanding um, that it's harder for the public to understand how we all work together One more thing, yeah. and not to put you on the spot, but if someone was here and we had a question, it would be, might be helpful to have you oh, for that. Certainly. Oh, certainly. No, absolutely. Especially if we have a question about your deliberation. Yeah, sure. you're talking no, we, yeah. we can decipher so much from watching it in the minutes, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it's easier if we can just ask a question. But yeah. It's up to you, of course. It would be another meeting. <laughs> <laughs> And I think you would you would probably, as a commission, have a sense of those in yeah. those cases where it probably makes sense to do that, and where yeah. it may not be necessary to, mm -hmm. just from your own deliberations. And I didn't want to lose track of the notion of that that sort of that tracking document going from mm -hmm. the initial stages through, and what were the concerns that were raised, and and you know how were they addressed, or do or can't they be addressed, or does code not require them to be addressed or some of those, you know, ways to be responsive and help the public and ourselves track that feedback we got and how we're dealing with it. Um, I think that be, would be helpful both for us as decision makers but also uh, for the public and their understanding um, and, and frankly for you coming into your hearing, uh, you know, before the public as well because um, that, that will help you kind of um, regather your thoughts about something you may have seen a few months ago and, and now it's gone through all those steps and it's back before you. So The other thing about the tracking is if we saw a pattern over a number of developments, that would be something we should actually address mm -hmm. outside of that so that we make mm -hmm. changes to, mm -hmm. to the zoning. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that because I think actually it kind of goes back to talking about all the code, you know, changes we did that we may not have thought about something or now that it's been in place that, you know, it's not working like we intended. Mm -hmm. And so that would be something also we'd want to make sure that you would bring forward if you're seeing that 
problem with with our changes in codes or current codes that that you may want to make recommendations to the council that are causing some un, unforeseen issue or or things to make it better um, the other thing was uh, in relation to the sustainability incentive mm -hmm. in the in the code I think mm -hmm. Just and I, once again, if the council has a little different take than I did, but I, I, I thought our conversation at that time was that it seemed like a lot to jump into a program that was very laid out in the code and, and had a lot to it without a lot of experience as to how it works. And I think we talked about maybe there was a way to do a pilot or something like that. And mm -hmm. I think that just kind of then it. it it kind of mm. sat and didn't necessarily go somewhere. So it might be worth some thought from the commission's perspective, maybe working with staff too, is is there a way to either do do it particularly focused in a couple of areas rather than more broadly uh, and or looking at it from the point of view of, of trying to pilot something, you know, without it being uh, across the board applicable to everything. Um, I think that's kind of where we're coming from and our, our, our reticence to kind of put something into, into place without some better understanding of sort of how it may work, um, because as as Councilmember Schroeder mentioned, you know sometimes we we change the code and it doesn't doesn't end up uh, working exactly as we expected, and so um, you know we can we can handle that post mortem on the uh, on maybe you know on the the, the EV uh, charging station requirements in our mm -hmm. parking code that we have, you know if that, yeah. if some if one of those numbers as to requirements isn't working, we're yeah. going to know pretty quickly and we can we can make those adjustments, but uh, mm -hmm. sometimes you know when it's a much more sort of broad program it's a little harder to know what's going to happen was there um, in consideration for what we were looking at was um, incentivizing mm -hmm. sustainability so sort of the carrot approach if if you do this or if you do these three things then you get these points and you can have increased density or whatever the um, is that of interest to the council to keep going down that path of in trying to incentivize through bonuses like that or looking at more targeted applications like EV charging. We're just going to say if it's a project over this size, suggest that you make it EV ready. Um, is there feeling of direction on that? Yeah, I don't know that we had a problem necessarily with looking at it from an incentive point of view. I think that makes a lot of sense to do that, especially as we're sort of all getting into this more um, and, and the development community is trying to catch up as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think now that I remember our conversation, we did have some concerns about how how bonuses worked and how they worked in conjunction with other mm -hmm. bonuses that we already had in mm -hmm. our code. Yeah. And so I think there was just some, some logistical issues. things that, yeah. that we weren't 100% sure about. And so that may be worth some more discussion on the part of the commission as well as just, you know, understanding it, are we doubling up on some of these things or how are we counting things and making sure that it all kind of works mm -hmm. together. So um, that may be, but I don't think we're, uh, I don't think that, that we're saying that the incentive idea is, is a bad idea or anything like that. Um, it, it, it could be that we decide to, to apply incentives only in certain areas to begin with and then broaden it out or, uh, you know, I'm not sure. But I, I think definitely we had some <coughs> issues and concerns. It probably would be worth looking at our meeting minutes again just <laughs> to, to, to have an understanding of that. Right. I know uh, Commissioner McGee. Yeah. Um, well, I have a different take on sustainability, maybe than anybody here. But for me, we had, if there was a pattern of objections that we had over the past year and a half. It was it was density and subdivision. And if you look seriously at sustainability and realize that we have the highest impervious surface of any of the metro area cities, then when we are now talking about increased density, we're talking about more increased impermeable surface. We're talking about less trees. We're talking about more water runoff issues and more flooding issues, which we already have. And so there's two angles to do. There's, there's an incentive angle where we do EV stations and so on, but there's also a zoning issue here where we think about the community at large and when we put in walking paths that's great we had 
and we should put in walking paths. They're important, but that is more impervious surface in, in our community. And we already have a lot of traffic a lot and a lot of air quality issues. And so I think we should pay attention to both sides of sustainability. And the other one is the environmental side and what kind of environment are we creating here in terms of air quality, health, um, noise, traffic, all of those things. And that Im impermeable surface is a piece of that. And if you look at some of our zoning code, I was quite surprised um, when I went over the code for the, um, the units that are on a church parking lot, the side setbacks for those units are greater than the side setbacks for a single family home in Roseville. And I think anybody who's been on the council for any length of time realizes that five feet, if you have a side entrance to your garage, or you're trying to move snow away along the side, or you're trying to get your trailer into the backyard, or your boat into the backyard where it's supposed to be, um, it's pretty tricky if you've only got five feet. And it's also, as we go forward, I think a light issue because a two-story next to a lot of our single-story homes, that's five feet from the side, if it's five feet and five feet, essentially darkens that whole side of the, the home. So I think there are some things within the code that we could look at. The other thing I don't know how even you get it in the code, but I noticed um, particularly at the, the one at McCarran's where we did the large um, units there, the condominiums with no side setbacks and so on. The community, and the, and at the end of the day, the community asked that that lot number one, which really kind of screened the whole development from the street and from the other residents, that's in many ways all they ended up asking for. And, and they, didn't, they didn't get that either. <laughs> and it was sort of, you know, sometimes, like we said in the early sketch plan to have, you know, some small thing that does not really impact a large development of 20, 20 some units makes a difference to the community to feel like they're heard and to feel like they have made some effort to be accommodated. Yeah, and, and so I think that, that that is always our challenge because ultimately, even if there are objections, if the objections don't rise to the level of something that's actually not allowed in our code, mm -hmm. developers can go ahead with a project, as we all know, yep. that still meets the letter of the code and doesn't make anybody happy except themselves. And so, you know, ultimately, we're kind of all in a position where we ultimately have to approve it. So we won't be able to necessarily avoid that but i think the point being is that we can we can certainly try to, to as much as possible deal with issues as early as possible in the process and, mm -hmm. and in those cases where those projects end up coming making it all the way through we we just have to deal with them at that point as as what they are and, and hopefully that that good tracking of all those issues helps us to understand where we're at at that point and and maybe it can even be a reminder to developers uh, and and i think that one of the things and this is not meant to have an opinion one way or the other on, on the point raised about the density and impervious surface. Um, there's There seems to be developing in the community of an environmental and sustainability the, the conflict between, you know, density is good because we don't have sprawl, and sprawl is bad because that's a lot of driving, a lot of excess, you know, uh, you know miles put on cars and, and more impervious surface in a larger area versus the density, you know, doesn't have that sprawl, but now you've got those other issues, and so where are those trade-offs? And, you know, I don't know that we, that anybody knows exactly what the right answer is, but uh, certainly that's something that was I, a part of Minneapolis's issues uh, with their update to their kind of plan and zoning code and, and how that's gone back and forth uh, because of those same questions. So right. hopefully when, when Minneapolis figures it out, we can just benefit from all that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that would be Paul the case. St. Paul seems to have figured it out a little bit better than we right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah, so I, I think there, you know, I, there is a happy medium somewhere, yeah. but I'm not sure based on my experience on the planning commission that we've quite found it yet. Sure. 
Well, and I think one of the things we're fortunate about is that even with the five foot setback, you know, not everybody's building right up to the five foot at this point, or historically has. Uh, so we're we're at least in a, in a position where we don't have every home right now already at the five foot setback. Yeah. So, um, but that's those are you know points taken and things we need to continue to to look at and have conversations about. Are there other things that we need to make sure and cover as we've got ourselves with each other tonight? Does the commission feel like you've got some good feedback from the council? Did we miss any of the issues that you wanted to make sure we provided feedback no. on? No, this was, this was great. Anyone else? Yes. Did you, miss anything? you can always email us, too, because we do <laughs> respond to our emails. <laughs> I was going to say, please, please communicate more often if it need be. Yes. Sure. Within, within all the constraints of the open meeting. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> We don't want we don't want all those those to comments to have the, the chilling effect. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we want to make sure that we're still having robust conversations just within the the at least yeah. the spirit. Well, we're all still citizens, so right. we can write to you. That's yeah. for sure. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you again for being here this thank evening you. and for having uh, such great representation of the commission with uh, the joint meeting tonight. And look forward to yeah. your upcoming deliberations. Hopefully, we'll actually have some development proposals yeah. for you to look at as well. I know it's been kind of a little bit quiet lately uh, now that we've gone through kind of a spurt of all the riling properties and some other things getting developed. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, look forward to whatever's coming next. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And just a, maybe a note to Mr. Trudgeon too, if we need to, and maybe work with planning staff too, if there's something we need to do related to the rules procedure for the planning commission to, or any of the commissions to add something, let's make sure that that's on an upcoming discussion if we need it on a council right. discussion. We'll right, great. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we don't have any more agenda items in last, well, I imagine Mr. Trudgeon is gonna give us the update on the future agendas coming up, so. Uh, I mean, let's pull that over up. Mr. Trudgeon for that. So uh, we have another meeting next Monday. We have three in October, and this uh, will be substantially longer um, than uh, the last couple of meetings. So we have uh, the ordinance amendment with sacred settlement. I think the council did talk through that pretty thoroughly before, so I think it's uh, pretty straightforward, but we have that. We want to talk about potential modifications to Rosefest, uh, talk about potential improvements to Rosebrook Park, also uh, look at approving the concept plan for the new park at County Road B, one of our more recent developments, Midland Legacies Estates. We have a couple of uh, final plans and specs for uh, some pathways, um, then uh, looking to um, approve the classification and compensation plan. Uh, the SRO contract, we hope to have uh, all, all uh, shored up um, for the 23rd. We're working uh, diligently on that. And then we do have a nuisance abatement at uh, 2170 Cohansey. As you know, oftentimes the abatement should appear on the council yeah. agenda and then they do get cleaned up, but um, we'll have to see how that goes. After that, we do have um, two meetings on November 6th, an EDA meeting. We have several items that are listed uh, there. And then also for the regular council meeting, we do have um, a public hearing to accept the county road fee feasibility study and order the improvements. And this is one of the rare uh, projects where we actually will have assessments to the property owners. So uh, there's been a series of meetings with the property owners and so that'll be coming forward. So that might be a little bit different than, than, than we're used to as far as awarding a contract for a road project. Uh, we also want to have a presentation by the community action team. It was alluded to a little bit uh, tonight in the PD, but this is the uh, police uh, officers uh, and social workers and uh, uh, housing navigator working together. We want to provide an update, begin the discussions on the fee schedule, on the utility rates, uh, also discussion regarding short-term rentals. We're not looking for any particular um, uh, ordinance to pass that evening. It's more just kind of, here's the feedback we received. Let's talk about some next steps and when we do that. Uh, we also uh, will um, be um, uh, hopefully approving the 24 City Council on EDA calendar. I did send that out uh, over the weekend or on Friday, and I know every date may not work for everybody, but certainly it's an ability uh, collectively. If you do want to change some dates, we could. We just follow the same traditional pattern that we've had before. Uh, and then uh, the uh, ordinance amendment and policy for the reasonable accommodation, something we've also talked about before. We're just shuffling things around a little bit to make sure we have... Uh, enough time to cover everything. So that'll be a ni nice, busy couple of meetings. The next meeting after that is not until after Thanksgiving, November 27th. So we're, we're getting down to just a few meetings in the year. So you might see a little bit more of a scramble to get some items done before the mm -hmm. end of the year, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Yep. That's all I have. All right, thank you, Mr. President. I just did want to check or suggest on the 23rd to the extent that there are items that are probably going to have public mm -hmm. participation, we should try to schedule those earlier. 
the ones the you know that are more administrative we can move those types of actions later in the meeting yep. and to the extent anything can be on the consent agenda that's always a good thing too. certainly yep all right yep. uh, any other thoughts uh, from council well, member on the uh, holding the public hearing for count, except county road b feasibility they had a very good meeting at the uh at Tetcha last week and it was well attended and the uh the public works department did, an, in my opinion, did an excellent job. Mm -hmm. Great, because mm -hmm. uh, it's not always the easiest thing, especially when you have an assessment coming up. So, mm -hmm. people had lots of questions, and they had lots of really good answers, and seemed to satisfy people. Good, so. glad to hear that. Good to know. Right, uh, and just also to that extent, uh, or to that item, uh, I was, I think we do, we have had assessment projects before, and I'm presuming. That the ins the assessments are primarily for pathways and things like that because we don't assess typically the road, no, other than the road okay. over a certain yeah. a certain level of construction. I'm not sure of the answer on that. Maybe okay. <laughs> we'll we'll definitely, definitely, I think yeah. well, there's curb going in. Okay, so yeah, yeah. Th there'll be more. Uh, yeah, so I think it's it's like anything that's above sort of our standard yes. 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 residential yeah. road, then we do <laughs> assess that. So yeah. 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 All right, just want to, and obviously we'll make that abundantly clear as part of the public hearing. Yeah, right. I, don't think, I think the last assessment we did may have been 2015, 2016, so it's been a while, so we're all a little bit out of practice with that. So <laughs> engineers are on top of it, but I, I'm not all that familiar with the ins and outs yeah, of it sure. either, so we okay. can learn more. Well, I, the reason it came up is because I had mentioned during, I had a meeting with um, um, some realtors. They had invited mayors from around the, the area. Um, and uh, one of the things I, I talked about, Roseville uh, being a good place to own a home because we don't do a lot of assessments. So <laughs> that's well, and, and that great is timing. true. Yeah. And, well, and it is, it is true. Good I mean, point. you know, definitely uh, other communities pay 100% of their road projects yes, through do. assessments yeah. as opposed to what we do. So so it's still a valid point, but it just, it was interesting that that, <laughs> that, that you mentioned that just now. Uh, future agenda items for council members or uh, items uh, uh, for uh, like announcements or communications, uh, council member Strong. Just communication. Last week was the Board of Metro Cities, um, an in-person meeting, first time in <laughs> three or four years, um, and I. They continue to seek guidance um, uh, on the SRO. Um, I think we're approaching some <laughs> guidance, but a lot of questions were raised about the cannabis. Um, <laughs> law and the application in the cities and so I just knew know that they continue to seek guidance on our behalf I asked some other questions that we've discussed in our meeting that maybe were from a different lens that had, than had been approached in the past and so um, just want you to know that that is moving forward at a level higher than us mm -hmm. um, with with their interest in trying to seek answers for all of the cities well, that's great because there are our legislative representatives or lobbyists on behalf of the metro cities and so they will hopefully be able to connect with the people at the legislature who, who can answer all those questions for us yeah. all right great anything else from uh, council well, just council a reminder board? thursday is the uh, north east youth and family services ribbon cutting in white bear lake uh the clinic has been reopened and renovated and so on so that'll be from 3 45 i have until 5 or something mm -hmm. like that so that's on the 19th yeah. And the address is 1280 North Birch Lake Road, Boulevard. <coughs> so you can Google where that is. <laughs> and we, we, we can repeat the announcement too that we have the groundbreaking for the uh, Ramsey County uh, Waste Facility. The uh, waste is the wrong word yeah. for recycling, recycling slash yeah. you know mm -hmm. responsible use or whatever uh, facilities on the 24th at 4 p.m. Uh, <laughs> yes. on Kent Street in Roseville, it's just off of Larpenter. So uh, yes. if you want to participate in that, if there's nothing else before the council. Uh, the only other item on our agenda is a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All right, it's been moved by Councilmember Strawn, seconded by Councilmember Groff. <laughs> Flipped a coin. Um, <coughs> no discussion on a motion to adjourn. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. We're adjourned at 7.13 p.m. Thank you, everyone. Yes.